Welcome to Hot Girls Theory. It's Ash. And I'm Indy, and this is a podcast where we explore the world from the theoretical perspective of two hot girls. It's usually The Conversation or The Guardian or something like that. But um, this is an article from Cecilia Lezen. It's titled, Why are 18, 19-year-olds out here getting BBLs? TikTok has discussed the realities of Brazilian butt lifts following a popular trend. Ooh. So this is a very Ash-centric yeah. <laughs> article. But amid the rise of the BBL effect meme, some TikTokers are discussing the realities of Brazilian butt lifts and questioning why so many young people are getting the procedure. So TikTok user Melissa, known as Melanated Mel, said in a viral TikTok that BBLs are not for everybody. A Brazilian butt lift or a BBL is a fat transfer operation that takes fat from one part of the body and injects it into the buttocks for an enhanced backside. And it's not cheap. Why are 18, 19 year olds out here getting BBLs at breaking the bank? Your body hasn't even finished growing, Melissa questioned, adding in an on-screen caption, getting BBLs was normalized to the wrong generation. A lot of Gen Z does not have common sense. Melissa believes that teenagers are going to unqualified plastic surgeons who graduated from Zoom University two days ago. <laughs> she, I love that. <laughs> she clarified that she's pro-surgery if it makes people happy, but thinks people should wait until they have the money for a safe procedure. Preach. <laughs> and also the fully cognitively like developed brain to make that decision. And, and let your body at least get to 23 for a butt and boobs, honey. Trust me. Trust me on that. Um, she also pointed out that people can die from BBL surgeries. Roxanne Ramsey on TikTok stitched Melissa's video saying, that's so true. As someone who recently went with her friend to a BBL appointment in Miami, Florida, she said she was shocked to see so many young women in the waiting room. Literally, it was 30 chairs in the waiting room and every chair was taken up. Girls were coming right off the plane, their luggage in the waiting room with them. They were wheeling around girls in wheelchairs who had just undergone their surgeries and putting them right into their vehicles. The facility, which was not identified, allegedly didn't have enough pain medication to go around because there were so oh many God. patients. It was a trap house for BBL, she said. I'm sorry, but if a medical facility doesn't have enough pain medication, someone doesn't have their like doctor doctorate or like th- there's something fishy that's, about that that's facility. That's so like quintessential America though, mm-hmm. to hear these kinds of stories. Literally. She clarified in the comments that she supported people who want to get BBLs regardless of age. She further expressed she wanted young women to be safe and do their research beforehand because some people were booking doctors based off popular Instagram pages. Mm. Another TikToker, Faith Ashton Lawler, gave a breakdown of her personal BBL expenses, which included hotel and travel totaled to $6,784. Now, this is America, so what Australian would be 8K, 9K? Yeah, and then the BBL is like what it is like expensive. Yeah, it's pricey. Yeah. <laughs> While some commenters thought her bill was cheaper than expected, several others thought it was too costly considering the risk. However, she did clarify that prices can vary and that's what she paid also in Miami. And Miami is like known for just, that's where you get a lot of cheap hot shit done basically. Yeah. And BBL procedures have been on the rise in recent years. Journalist Sophie Elmhurst explained in The Guardian earlier this year that it's becoming an increasingly popular surgery, especially with the rise of, as we all know, the Kardashians, and it's increasingly dangerous. Elmhurst cited a study that one in 3,000 BBLs results in death. In Miami, a popular destination for this surgery, NBC Miami reported last year, so in 2020, that 15 people died in recent years as a result of the procedure. This is a very Ash-centric article to bring to the table. (laughs) And I just wanted to, I like my TikTok's full of this meme because I do think it's funny. And two, it is a procedure I wanted to have for a very long time and despite your (laughs) voluptuous booty that you already have on you which well I was talking to um my boyfriend about it and it's because and it's a bit sad now I say it out Mm. loud I grew up like hating my butt for a long time because it was too big then I grew up loving my butt and now we're entering a world that I feel like my butt's not big yeah because my butt's a real big butt and it just doesn't look like the 
you know, the, yeah. the BBL butt. Always, yeah, the BBL. The, the, it doesn't look like that. There's a big difference between like a naturally big butt and a BBL butt. And I think that what's, I mean, you finish up, you f- go on because I have thoughts as well. So okay, go, you finish okay. your stuff and I'll go into it. <laughs> Okay, so I remember talking to my trainer about it um, ages ago because she just got her boobs done. So we we're just talking about surgery, and I was like, "Oh, like I really want a BBL." And she was like, "Have you seen the def stats, Ash? Like they're insane." Oh yeah, so like I see boob jobs as like going to the dentist. Like, they're so routine at this point. I know so many girls who boob have boob jobs, and they're not like the shitty 80s ones that are hard as rock that like they look fucking real like they're insane a bbl is very different to a boob job first it's a two-part surgery obviously they have to harvest so they have to harvest from like your stomach or thigh then they have to inject and graft that into your butt the recovery if you follow veruca salt on instagram she got one her body was like full body swelling, bruising everywhere. She was in intense pain. Align that with the one in 3000 death rate. It's not fun. (laughs) It doesn't like, it's exciting if it goes right, but if it goes wrong, it's a bit like. And "Mm." it going right is also this really big committing process to which like you have this risk of like, you know, potentially like being left with not just death, but like Deep, being dis, dis, dismembered I'm not dismembered what's disfigured that's the word I'm looking exactly. for exactly well you just have to remember people who go to get these things done to not a great doctor and they get they find cement in their butt they find mm-hmm. like weird shit in their butt like it's fucked now one of my favorite shows whoever exists is botched <laughs> and Dr. Terry is my favorite doctor on it and he did an interview recently I believe it was with E.T. And he explained why it's deep. There are these very little veins in the buttock that leads directly to your vena cave. This is a lot of (laughs) medical jargon. I've watched a lot of Grey's Anatomy, but I I cannot speak (laughs) medical jargon, which is the major blood vessel that brings blood back from your body to your heart and to your lungs. If you get fat in those little vessels and it gets into the main vena cava and goes to your lungs, it's over. There are risks involved with the injection of the fat, and this is where training and experience is so important. If the fat is injected too deep or in the wrong area, the fat can enter the bloodstream and cause issues such as pulmonary pulmonary embolus or clotting. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. (laughs) A lack of regulation, as he, he just kind of alluded to, is also another fatal component. As I know lots of people are going, like Brazil is obviously a place that people go, but Turkey, I mean, before it's the literally pandemic, more Brazilian butt lift, so literally. Think. <laughs> but Turkey is the new place. Like everyone's going to Turkey to get plastic surgery done because it's hella cheap. But as they say, if it's too good to be true, if it's too cheap, like it's too good to be true. Let's be honest. Now, lastly, I just want to bring in the fact that it is funny the demand for such a procedure in a society that is so obsessed with like yeah. ethnic ambiguity. Amb- oh, I can never amb- <laughs> that word. <laughs> and sorry, I just can't talk today. I, I've only had one coffee. But um, when I know my Instagram feed, because I guess everyone can gather what my Instagram feed is, it's a bunch of white girls who have butts like this, who say they haven't had one, but from 2018 to 2021, mm. puberty can't do When that. you're already like, an adult. It's, it's insane. <laughs> and exactly, when you're already an adult. Like, for example, Michaela Testa, do you know who you would know who Michaela Tester is? No, I don't. No. She is pretty big on TikTok and she's an she's an OnlyFans creator and she's one of the top in Australia. And she people who know who I'm talking about will know the shade I'm not trying to <laughs> throw, but trying to throw. She does a pretty fucking good job of saying she's never had one and then contradicting herself constantly. And then in her, because she does those like daily vlog kind of TikToks. And, like, she went – she was going through her house. She was showing, like, a cinema room, and there was literally a BBL chair. You don't buy this chair unless you've had a BBL. It's, like, so you can sit with a hole. It's like a um like a pool donut thing, but for your butt. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I just think, like, one, girls showing off bodies that are BBL bodies, but they don't say it, and then lying that they're not. I also think that's pushing a lot of girls to get it. Just because the mention of it, and I don't know, it's a hot mess. Because we can tell, I know, you can tell. We can but tell. Indy, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, that that leads directly off what I was going to say before, so it's perfect because I was going to talk about like the amount of 
models that have BBLs nowadays because obviously like the the beauty standards are changing towards that ethnic ambiguity and part of ethnic ambiguity or you know more ethnically inclined bodies is obviously having a very specific kind of body type and that specific kind of body type includes an ass and and, and an ass that is noticeably big not just like in certain angles because I feel like I feel like everyone can angle their booty to a, unless you really have like, like a, a flat, part, yeah. it's an ironing board at the back. Yeah. You you can angle your booty. You can take nice pictures. There you go. And this is something that I've also learned through my own journey with my butt, because we, we, we also have discussed like how I feel like I don't have the best booty, but like I've seen, I've I'm seen coming photos to love it as it is. you've showed me and you're booty cute. <laughs> exactly. Like I have a cute, like I have a cute juicy booty. I wouldn't say I have like your kind of butt where it's like mm. badonkadonk all day long <laughs> because where how I naturally stand, it just mm. doesn't do that. And I think that the thing, the problem is that having models that have had BBLs, because it's not models who have ma- naturally big bo- booties, it's, it's models who have had BBLs and they are modeling clothes specifically gym wear or Mm. you know lingerie for example I find it's also very common in lingerie even in plus size lingerie there's always girls who have like the hourglass figure with no stomach because they've had a BBL and it really fucks with your perception of how your body should look because you think why does my ass not do that why why am I not curvaceous at the back and it goes have that like perfect like round like like the the scoop like that scoop on your back Yeah. yeah the scoop yeah, because I'm like, what? I, what? I, uh, and then it's just, it, it really fucks with your perception. And it's really interesting as well, because it reminds me of like the start of June or maybe the end of May, I went studying at a cafe with my friend. And oh, you know how like on the TV in cafes, they'll have like, oh, like Channel the, the 9 Today or Channel 7. Or something. Yeah. It was the Today <laughs> Show. Always. And they were literally discussing the increase in Australian women getting BBLs and like the the increase in demand for them because obviously it's like such a topical cultural phenomenon at the moment to be going okay why is this happening and how can we make sure that people are doing it as safe as possible and they had some dude on I think he was like well I think he was gay like they usually are gay and he was like I guess maybe some kind of plastic surgery. I wasn't, I couldn't like listen to it, but I was just reading the subtitles as they kind of came on really delayed. And he was, and they were kind of like, you know, who's getting BBLs? And he was like, well, everyone, yeah. even men. And I was like, um, I don't think okay. Men. Like, like and de- definitely there's no. men out there, but like. <laughs> and then, but then they were also discussing about how like there's been an increase in it since COVID because people are just like spending their money on whatever they want, which I find also interesting. And I think, okay, now going back to Veruca Salt, for me, I had a few people that I followed on Instagram who were, you know, women who were like tattooed and voluptuous anyway, but they had had BBLs and they weren't denying it. And they did OnlyFans and stuff like that. And I ended up getting to a point where I was like, I have to unfollow you because I have to like preserve for my own sanity and my own like mental health and not because I was constantly being like, I wish my body looked like that. I wish my body looked like that. But there's only one way my body will look like that. And it's, that's if I have a life threatening surgery. And so for me, I follow Veruca on TikTok only because there's a lot of like headshots. <laughs> there's a lot of body shots of her. So I can feel better about it. And she's talked about it a lot. And I think that like, you know, she did what she wanted with her body, but she also did the research. I know for a fact that she went to someone and she also like saved that money hardcore through her OnlyFans. And then once she had it, she was like, all right, I'm making this decision. And she could, that's fair. That's that's valid. You do what you want. But there is definitely like there needs to be more discourse going around about how just it's going too far to the point where like women don't know what the body yeah, should look like it just, it's just they like, don't and that's the thing like I the fact that I and like my boyfriend looked at me like you think you don't have a butt and I was like I don't like I look in the mirror and I'm like that is the flattest ass I've ever seen and it's mm. just because like the dysmorphia yeah, and the dysmorphia <laughs> and it's just like I, I know because so, so many people are like fuck you have a good butt and I I think it's just honestly the Kardashians and Michaela Tester and all these girls who are oh, just absolutely. like, I haven't had anything done. This is my natural body. And even though I know it's... If you're going to get it done, say it. Just don't fucking lie. say it. Yeah. Like, the day I get my tits done or, like, whatever done, I'm showing it everywhere. I'm like, I paid, what, 10 grand for these tits? I'm going to show them everywhere. Like, everywhere. But anyway. <laughs> Indie. 
life updates. What are you up to? I find myself, I don't have a lot of like true crime specific, specifically, specifically on my TikTok for you page, but every now and then, you know, something comes up. And I'm definitely not as interested in the stuff that like, you know, Bailey Sarian talks about because I can just go to Bailey Sarian for that. I'm interested in the stuff where it's like people who are unknown who like escaped that stuff. And like, it's like so weird. This like makeup TikTok came up and it was this girl recreating this makeup and she was telling someone else's story. Oh, I've story. seen so shit I was like, like okay. that before. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's with their permission, so it's fine. But I was like, I watched it and I was like, this is interesting, but I don't want to hear it from her. I want to hear it from like, the person so I went back to the person's like credited original TikTok page and I found all of the videos like I went through every single video on this person's TikTok it took me like an hour but I scrolled down to the bottom and it was so fucked I was like terrified these people like the what kind of got you in was this lady first posted this TikTok of like these are videos that we I like took on a camping trip hours before being hunted and I know murdered. this yeah keep going yes yeah. the flowers don't growl yeah and I got really stuck into it because she just was obviously talking about her story about how she went camping with her partner while she was five months pregnant and she thought he was going to propose so she kept like picking flowers and taking heaps of pictures the whole time and there was a car accident and her and her partner ran from their campsite to the car accident, like bolted because they wanted to see if everyone was okay. There was police there. They took statements. That was it. That was done. Then they were walking back, but they didn't go back to their campsite straight away. They diverted down to go to the bathroom. Obviously if Ash already knows this, that's fine, but I'm telling for everyone else. They diverted back down to the bathroom. She finished in the bathroom. She comes out. They're standing there ready to go back. And this, she sees this flashlight running like someone's running with a flashlight so they can see like a strobe light basically going and they're joking about it like haha he really must need the shit like whatever and he stops immediately in front of them just like stop like instantly and goes like wow you guys are fast and basically just like keeps commenting on them and like tells it's really weird if you want to listen to the whole thing flowers don't growl on tiktok go through all of her videos but it just was so creepy because she just like had this really bad gut instinct the whole time. And obviously her partner didn't because he's a man and <laughs> yeah, all of that oblivious. Stuff. <laughs> so I was in that wormhole for so long, like reading all the comments, like watching all the videos, how she was reacting to it. And I just couldn't believe that people also were like, haha, this is just for attention. Like you just like the attention. This isn't real. This never happened. Or like maybe it did happen, but you need to stop like you know, complaining about it. How she how she was talking about it, I feel like it happened because a bit oh, yeah. a, a bit of me was like, oh, it's just a tick, like a creative TikTok thing, good on her. And then as I was listening, I was like, no, I think this happened. Also the way she made her videos, she had like big stickers across herself because she didn't want to like people to see her. And I feel like that's because she was getting quite emotional about it at times as well. It was also because she's like, I'm insecure, which I get. Do whatever you want, sis. But like I would the whole time I was like, no, this isn't fake. This is so. How would you have that many pictures, and then be like, oh, just a coincidence? You know what I mean? Oh my God, that does bring up. I was listening to a podcast last night, morbid podcast. Everyone should listen to it if you like true crime. And one of the girls on there was talking about finding a TikTok account, and I forgot what it's called. I wish I remembered. And every month, it looks like like this guy will like he has scratches all over his hand and he'll film his hands and then he'll film like a throwing a suitcase over a bridge and like shit falls out. And it looks like a body and a- everyone thought it was a joke, but every month he gets wiped clean. And now there's a theory that like each month he does that. And it, there's a theory that like, he's actually like murdering people. And then, cause like you watch the, you, you watch the videos and you're like, Oh, like it's just like a creative, like film. I know something. But then, like, you watch it and you just get a feeling like mm, TikTok does have the power to be the new, like, what Facebook Live was, you know, yeah. when people were murdering people on that. Like, I don't know. It's creepy. <laughs> we love TikTok for these little. There's already been stuff like that on TikTok as well. Like, people doing really crazy stuff on TikTok and TikTok having to take it down instantly. The next one is, like, I'm going to have to be very careful about what I talk about just because things are still happening and it's like a still continuously updating uh thing but i'm mostly curious like if anyone else listening has had experience with this please feel free to dm either myself or the hot girls account we'll see it regardless but um something's going on with my partner and he's going through a lot right now and kind of 
coming to the realization that like his parents aren't like who he thought they were. I mean, he, he knew about his dad, but like his mom in particular, and it's kind of, it's really impacting him. And I won't get into every single detail because there's just too much going on, but essentially from the beginning of our relationship or even when we were dating, I noticed that like his parents had been somewhat financially abusing him. And the other day we found out like just to what extent that was, how bad that was essentially. And TLDR, they basically stolen 20 grand off of him and like just blatantly like stolen it. And, you know, it's just, it's really, really upsetting and frustrating because I'm obviously having to support him through this, but I'm also trying, I'm, I'm angry and I'm also like, mm, fuck you. I'm fuck angry. Yeah. If, if, if I lived in Melbourne, I would be fucking throwing shit. Like I yeah. would. Ugh. And I, I haven't even fully gone into detail with Ash about it yet because I haven't had the chance because on Saturday, like we went to the bank and, and yeah, and, and we've kind of gotten this recourse, this, this, this recourse route that we can go down, but we just have to, it, it's hard because there's like no way to prove certain things. And that's, what's really frustrating because there's a lot to do with like his dad being scummy and wanting to, I guess, like trick the government for less for lack of a better term um but he always kind of defended his mom and defended her actions throughout like his parents relationship and I think now he's just realized like fuck it's actually really bad and it's actually she doesn't deserve that kind of treatment anymore and I said to him I was like you're gonna have to seriously like if you're not gonna seriously set boundaries with her you seriously have to re re think your relationship with her because she's your mom she's supposed to protect you she's not supposed to let this happen and any good parent is going to sit there and be like hey you have a lot of money that you've made from working and now you're 18 you you were 16 when you started making that money and good good on him for having that much money like Mm -hmm. i've wasted money when i first got a job like yeah literally literally and they were like okay you should any good parent rather sorry would be like you have all this money let's go get a really high interest savings account put it away don't touch it yeah exactly not and keep putting money into it not let's set up a transaction account and just take the card away from you before you even get the chance to get it and so that's happening um and that's not been fun to deal with and it's still ongoing so if anyone else has had experience with like either your parents financially abusing you or you know how like good resources for that please hit me up because we're definitely (laughs) i have no idea what to do uh, beyond like what we've been told to by the bank so yeah anyway what's (laughs) what's going on with you ash after that (laughs) so i had a week it's not as um it's so funny like the last couple of weeks you're always like oh my life hasn't been that dramatic and then in one go it's just <laughs> bang i think <laughs> season I think finale it seriously is like the, the mercury retrograde like the, this last week has just been super unlucky for all of my friends and then this anyway a little less dramatic than that i want to thank my girl beth for this who does listen i had a pretty freaky dream last night and it's one I've had before. Maybe you have had Indy. So do you know what like an incubus and a succubus is? Yes. I, yes. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. So for those who don't know, they're sexual demons. And succubus is the female kind and incubus is the male one. And like we all have sex dreams, like especially me. <laughs> and um, it's kind of weird because if you can physically feel it and physically have certain sensations and it's a little eerie there is a chance that you're dealing with one of these sexual demons either female or male and I don't know it's the dream I had last night was fucked it was like it was a sex dream and it was like me in a poly relationship which I could could never be because I'm a jealous bitch (laughs) but like it was like this guy but he was really dominant and like it was like a control type dream. And I've been having a lot of cult like dreams lately and felt this- a bit culty. And he was, we, he was having sex with me and the energy was straight as fuck. I could feel everything. And I woke up and I still, it was one of those times where you wake up and like, you still think you're in the dream and you have to like look around the room and be like, okay, well that's physically in my bedroom. So I know I'm in my bedroom, like kind of yeah. wake yourself back up to reality. I mean, you do have weird dreams a lot and you also do fuck with sex magic. So like, 
I'm just saying, put two and two together. But like, I blame Beth for this because she sent me a video about it last night. And I have, I've had this type of dream before, but like I was a teenager when I had it, but I still remember what it was. And when I was going to bed last night, like a weird ghost thing happened and I don't want to go into it because it was weird and a lot of bad energy, but like, I don't know. It was fucking weird. Like it was just like, I fuck with sex magic And, like, sex magic does deal with some dark magic if you're not careful. But, like, fuck, it's just, like, it was weird. But, anyway, Indy, can you go into detail? Oh, I haven't ever had a dream that (laughs) intense in terms of, like, where I've actually felt like that could be a possibility of dealing with either a succubus or an incubus. I've had some interest. I I feel like, okay, I'm not going to say I've had some. All of my sex dreams have been weird. Like, they've (laughs) never been just, like, oh, I'm thinking about someone like a celebrity or my boyfriend yeah like, it's, it's always it's been nev- fucking weird i'm jealous of people i'm jealous of people who are like oh, i dreamt i was having sex with jason momoa and i was like all my dreams besides the one last night it's usually me and i have a dick and i'm like fucking someone who mm. looks a lot like me and it's really weird <laughs> well, it's really okay, fucking weird, weird for me <laughs> is like the last sex dream i had was like and okay, this might be a little problematic. It's my dream. It's my subconscious. I can't explain it, but I'm always underage. I'm always underage and I'm always having sex with overage men. Ah, uh, no, I've had shit and like that before. Yeah. I don't understand. Freud, come figure it out for me, but maybe I want to fuck my dad. Who knows? Who knows? Um, He's dead. So need a Ouija board for that. Anyway. Um... <laughs> What? I'm fu- it's funny. <laughs> That's I'm laughing. Anyway, so you want to fuck your dad and old man. Okay. Go off. Uh, <laughs> ironic because my boyfriend is four years younger than me. But whatever. anyway, um, so the last one I had was literally I was like in a high school and it wasn't like my high school, but it was like vibes and like my best friend was there. So it was like the vibes, but it was like high school. If I was in high school now, for example, not like going back in time. And I was going about my time in high school and then I was like in a room with this teacher you know like the classic like American high school where like there's teachers rooms that have like couches in them it was like that yes oh my god anyway like yes the, the teacher is like this really gross old man who I would never actually have sex with you know what I mean like that kind of thing and but I was doing it like I was doing it manipulatively like I was like I want something I need something you know what I mean but I was also like 16 and I was like this is weird but like I woke up and I was yeah I I woke up and I was like mildly aroused but only because obviously like when you're having a sex dream like you are aroused but I was like what the fuck is that and then I remember I actually remember being like in high school or like being quite young and having a dream and this I cannot explain and I I don't even know if I want this in the podcast but I'm just gonna tell you for the fuck of it I was having this dream that I was like my age at that time yeah really really young and I was like in a bathroom where like men were coming in to have sex with me like 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 a rotation of like uh, like I was like a sex worker yeah basically. and I really liked it I mean <laughs> I really liked that's the good wait it's it's kind of hot but like that's it's I, yeah I I was like, why, like, when I was, like, that young, I was, like, I was, like, after I woke up, I was, like, why did I dream that? But why did I like that? You know what I mean? No, I, like, sometimes I dream about sex and it's sexual scenarios that, like, I shouldn't like, but I love. Like, I froth them. It's taboo. I froth them. And it's, like, having, like penetrative sex with girls where I'm like the guy and it's like I don't want to be a guy like I'm the most femme woman you can think of but like I wake up and I'm like fuck I want to like doggy girls like fuck that I, your subconscious like lets you yeah just enter really this release state. that yeah yeah and and release those feelings and actually like explore them I, I mean that's the whole point of dreams right and that's that's such a Freudian you know ana- analysis of our own subconscious we're, but we're, like we're giving you guys some fucking banger <laughs> fucking topics we haven't even got into the main topic yet today we and we're just like so here's my subconscious <laughs> opening it up just really cranking the brain open but yeah that's like that's been my experience with those dreams my only like how I've known about like I've known about succubuses since I was a kid because I like obviously used to watch Charmed because that's my favorite tv show and there's a particular episode if anyone's ever watched Charmed and you know the episode I'm talking about it's a fucking cooked like it's in season two and it's literally called she's a man baby a man and like there's a succubus and like it the, the the girl who's psychic like Phoebe who's psychic the character she 
um, is having these like dreams that through like she's channeling the succubus because she's psychic. And so she's having these dreams where she's like fucking men and she's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. And then she kills them and she's like, what the fuck? But then also like, why do I like that? That's kind of And cool. so, yeah, but the, the episode is very cooked. It's so fucking oh weird. God. It's so funny. I, it's weird. Every girl I know who watched, because I remember where, I remember being in primary school and like girls who watched Charmed, I was like, who the, like, that's so weird. Why do you watch Charmed? But every girl I know who watched Charmed, it's like kind of like a bad bitch now. I'm like, oh, they, they were like future There's bad bitches. I get it. girls and you're looking to support the pod there's many ways that you can do this as you would know by now but buckle up listen in and maybe actually do it if you haven't done it before a lot of you follow us on social media so you'd know that we have both twitter and instagram this is where you're going to keep up to date with all of our posts we post a lot of stories and reels and we're starting to post tiktoks to our instagram page so definitely make sure you're keeping up to date with all of that as always have our polls and questions up on our ig stories like we did for this particular episode so make sure that you're following us maybe even click the little bell turn on the notifications so that you can see when we get stories that'll be really helpful too you can make sure to hit us up at hot girls theory at on both of those socials this is also where you can give us feedback so you can let us know what you think what you'd like to hear next if you want to you know give us some input for what we need to be doing better on the on the pod you can find our instagram ashley is at ashley xo rose and i am at fuel by indie you can donate to us via the buy me a coffee link on all of our social media platforms under the title support the show these are one-off donations that start at five dollars and memberships are definitely in the works we're working on them we'll get them to you soon but it really means a lot. It helps us pay the bills, helps support us. We do have a lot of finances that go into making this podcast for you guys. So it really does help. And obviously a really great way that you can help us out if you love us is giving us a positive review on Apple Podcasts. Leave your Instagram handle so that we can read it out on the show. But the more you leave a positive review, it helps others find our show and grow. If you want to email us because we want to hear from you is hotgirlstheory at gmail.com. This is if you need advice or if you have an idea for an episode again, or if you have some articles that you want to send us, or if you just want to ask about previous episodes, we've been having a lot of um, dialogue with listeners in our emails at the moment, which has been really, really great. And so, yeah, make sure you're hitting us up everywhere. Hot Girls Theory. Now on to today's show, guys. Oh, I cannot believe this. All that manliness in one room, in one crowded room. <laughs> one hot, crowded room. Everybody's steamy bodies all pressed blanche, up against blanche, each other. Blanche, blanche. <laughs> Relax, you're about to set off the smoke detector. So, me and my housemates were talking a few nights back about something, and this question popped up, could you live without sex? And that's inclusive of no masturbation as well. Now, we took a vote, and... I was the only bitch who said no. (laughs) And before I get like a thousand eye rolls, because I don't know, I felt a little judged in that moment that I was the only one who said no. Honey, I would never judge you. I'm in the same boat. I know. (laughs) I was like, if Indy was here, we would be we would be debating this but um <laughs> now i'm not addicted to sex but i definitely have one of the highest libidos known to mankind <laughs> we thought it would be a pretty cool episode topic to just chat about because we've had pretty like researchy based episodes and i kind of like we both love when we have real discussion episodes where we're just like bouncing off each other so we asked you guys on the gram which is why you should follow at hot girls theory at G- well, I was going to say at gmail.com. <laughs> at hot- no, on Instagram. <laughs> oh my gosh, my brain. At Hot Girls Theory on Instagram. We asked you guys, could you voluntarily live without sex, inclusive of no masturbation? You guys voted and it's clear that 56% of you said you couldn't and 44% of you said you could last your entire life without sex. Which I'm like, girl, <laughs> boy. <laughs> Tell me why. (laughs) When asked what you guys thought, what others would say, 74% of you said everyone was too horny to last that long, while 26% of you actually had some hope in humanity. This kind of extends itself, I guess, to the conversation of sex is obviously a connection. So what are some other ways you connect with your partner? We had answers like kissing, cuddling, DNMs, holding hands, inside jokes, long hugs after long days. That's kind of cute. Being vulnerable, getting drunk together, back rubs, eye contact, playing with hair. You know, those like small intimate things. 
And it was interesting because someone said um, when they entered their 30s, this is what they wanted. It changed a lot from when they were in their 20s like me and just being horny (laughs) 24-7. This also brought up another question of what do you see sex as and I guess why they felt the way they did. Lots of answers surrounded that they can live without sex and have sex because they don't see sex as something to put on a pedestal. Someone said that... You know, it's not just sex that can give pleasure. And uh, others say that emotional connection is all that's needed for pleasure. And I don't know, it was just, it it was interesting to delve in the mind because it was such a funny question the other night. And then of course, hot girls, we make it go deep, (laughs) which I kind of, I like that. I like that about hot girls. It's interesting to see how people are kind of, they're thinking about their lives without sex. But I think like, okay, this is where I might like divert from this idea of celibacy because I think again celibacy can be many different things in many different contexts right Mm. but also like what about no intimacy and no desire and no because I feel like that's a lot of what celibacy actually is like voluntary celibacy is not just like being in a relationship and there being no sex it's also you know no it's it's it really is like no kind of sexual stimulation in any way so it's no kissing it's 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 no touching of this kind so i'm 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 all for the conversations yeah. that bring up like the many different ways that you can be engaging in sexual intimacy with your partner or not a partner or even yourself but like i really think that like for me the conversation like when we go off on, on all these different tangents comes back to like voluntary celibacy is none of these things yeah none is of engaging it. in yeah. none of it and i yeah. just i i couldn't i i couldn't i i fucking couldn't i i, I couldn't stand it i would I would have a very short lifespan if I couldn't have uh, like at least a desirability connection. Yeah. You know what I mean? I guess the the other night when I was the only one in the room that said no, <laughs> I remember stating these things and pe- and the people who were in the room going, oh, but I still could. And I was like, no. But that doesn't make you better than me, bitch. <laughs> it, yeah, it was kind of, I don't want to say that, but it kind of felt like Sorry, that Sorry, that moment, was really aggressive. <laughs> it kind of felt like that moment of like, just because I want to have... Mm sex a lot it doesn't make me like this fiend or this you know what I mean I absolutely do but I also because I think that like there's this association with like having a high sex drive or being really sexually Mm. active with like being kind of stupid and yeah and being like uh, animalistic and and not evolved because people but I people, love being animalistic right <laughs> that idea that you wanting to have sex or like really wanting to engage in sex mm. or not not necessarily a lot but just like not ever go without it shall we yeah. say is kind of makes you like less highbrow than people who are like I could go without sex because they'd just be sitting on their pedestals like reading books and like engaging with their like inner thoughts it's like but that doesn't that that doesn't bring you closer to any kind of like higher thought than having sex and also like I think it's more powerful to be able to be this highly driven when it comes to sex and I can also sit alone and think about highbrow things and inner thoughts and you know all that thing like why can't I have both you You can do that post orgasm glow right oh yeah post orgasm glow (laughs) Glow. (laughs) oh my god my brain is in the gutter today but anyway I feel like a few things should be mentioned why I'm like this and then of course we'll go to indies I'm very excited here because indie hasn't put much in her notes and I just want to hear what Indy says. <laughs> One is my bipolar disorder. I won't go crazy into this, but bipolar disorder, I've explained this before, very linked to hypersexuality. I brought this up before, but I definitely think my bipolar disorder has something to do with it because, you know, with mania and all that, hypersexuality comes to play. And I don't know, I just think it's pretty important to lay on the table of why I love sex so much and why I couldn't live without sex. But even outside the God complex moments, the mania moments, I'm still horny. So it can't just be that. (laughs) The second reason I think is that I'm a very femme woman. I find pleasure in my femininity and performing that. And I think the bedroom and having sex is one of those ways for me. Like I love the process of like getting dolled up and putting on lingerie and having sex and performing this very like I find pleasure in that I find a lot of sexual pleasure in that process of course I have sex freshly woken up sleep crust in the eye no makeup no lingerie like morning sex is the best yeah like I love morning sex but like I don't know I find a lot of pleasure in my femininity by having sex 
And also, I have said this again on this podcast. Sex for me for a very long time wasn't for me. You have to remember, I lost my virginity at 14 with the same boyfriend who, trigger warning, raped me. Then the relationship after that wasn't fulfilling. Yeah. The relationship after that, it was like, yeah, like give or take. And then like, <laughs> I don't know, if I, <laughs> I'm shady. I don't mean to be this shady on a Monday morning, but... <laughs> Sex for me became a very feminist thing for me because after those three relationships, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go out there. I'm going to have fucking sex. I'm not going to use it as this thing to keep from men. And then, you know, when they have, when they become boyfriend material, that whole thing of just keeping them just for boyfriends, I'm just going to have sex and have fun. And like, I'm not going to go along with this idea that good women or good girlfriend material women don't have yeah. sex a lot like fuck that and that's it's, just perpetuating know, patriarchy by having that mentality exactly and a true man will see my whole phase as a bene- as a beneficiary thing like i yeah. just i don't know i know my man does because i met him on that whole phase <laughs> I guess that whole idea of connection, like when I was having this conversation with my housemates, they were almost saying like connecting to partners, let's say like having showers together, not, you know, having like a sex, not having sex or like touching each other, stuff like that. Those were higher connecting points than sex. And like, I'm not saying they're not connecting because like I love having showers with my partner. Like I, I, I think it's cute. Not even having sex, just standing there talking and like, I don't know, I just like it. But like, For someone who has been raped and for someone who, like, I have a lot of body issues, to let someone in that space and have that access to Mm. me in, one, the trust factor of the power play, and two, seeing me in a multitude of positions that I don't have power on, you know what I mean? That level of trust and access is such a connection point for me. Absolutely. and And I was trying to explain that, and I don't know, I just feel like once... When you've had the experiences like me and you have had like sex is a different ball game sometimes, you know yeah. what I mean? And I don't know, to me, that's why I say I can't live without sex because one, there's some chemical reasons why I can't live without sex. And two, the main point is that I see sex as something that when it's with a romantic partner, I can just have sex with, with like casually no strings. But with a romantic partner, it's such a beautiful connecting spiritual experience for me that like two become one uh, I could sit there and play with hair and make eye contact and all that but there's something beautiful about sex that like I could never give up so Indy what about you <laughs> well everything you've said here I totally relate to and we've obviously talked mm. about these things like in other contexts throughout the podcast before I find it actually very interesting because I have noticed a decline in my libido in adulthood from being mm. like a teenager to 18 to 19 to let's say 20 and I don't know if it's any kind of chemical reason or if it's just purely in the fact that I don't have as much time anymore because there's definitely times where I'm like I'm horny but I definitely have found that like partnered sex for me my arousal is definitely like dependent on like the factor of like being desired and desire from my other yeah my the other person that I'm participating in sex with and so for me I think like when I was younger I would have been like, yeah, I can live without sex because I would just masturbate all the time. But like when I started having sex, especially when I started having sex with someone who I was in love with, Mm. that became, that kind of changed it, right? So I realized how much I needed that. At the time with that particular person who I was first having sex with, who I was in love with, it was very much like a validation thing as well. Like I felt a lot of control in the relationship by having sex with that person. But then there was a lot of like stinging moments where obviously he was very slut shamey and very like Mm. he was shameful towards me of my past. And it was again difficult because it was like, well, don't you like the fact that I'm experienced? Don't you like the fact that I know what I'm doing? Whereas you, you little virgin shit didn't know what anything like fuck off anyway um the only reason you know how to eat pussies because of me you owe me a lot fuck off anyway throwing the shade this morning because he deserves it but I think my hypersexuality definitely I wasn't hypersexual intentionally and then when I became more aware and more present in my relationships and the sexual relationships I was having I was being very picky about who I was being hypersexual with. Like I had to actually like you. And then when I was in my hoe phase and I was experimenting with like different levels of like hypersexuality and different levels of like, how much do I have to like you? And like, I realized very quickly with people that I didn't actually like very much that I didn't have to be that way with them and that it didn't matter because 
if I didn't want to, then I didn't fucking want to. You're exactly. gross. I don't want to suck your dirty dick anymore. Fuck off. When it comes down to that, obviously I also have my own personal experience with performing femininity, femininity and using sex in that way to, I guess, have control over how I'm perceived. And that's also really great. But again, as we've mentioned, like it's a really vulnerable thing to put yourself in with someone. Like you are the most vulnerable you could ever be, especially if you're not just like, having sex in the dark like not no no shade to having sex in the dark but if you're just like if you're really like lights on taking it slow going through the motions really connecting to every part of your body with this person it's super duper vulnerable whereas like if you're just like let's get this let, let, let's get your pants off and just keep everything else on like yeah that's not the same level of like sex and i think that that's what people kind of don't take into consideration is that there's lots of different kinds of sex to be having and that's why i couldn't live without it because there's certain kinds of sex that i couldn't live without like i absolutely no. know like i remember when i my ex and i did break up and um, i hadn't had sex for like four months and i got to a point where i was just, i was like i need to fuck i need a dick we've <laughs> all been there babe yeah we've all fucking been there <laughs> and so that, that that was like my moment because i there was like time in that like there was yeah time in the, those moments where i was like maybe i could just like not and just like wait and then i was like no bitch i can't do that i go gotta go <laughs> and so basically everything you've said i definitely agree with i think when it comes to voluntary celibacy it has to be like no masturbation no pleasure no intimacy no sexual stimulation of any kind because otherwise it's too easy to be like yeah i could live without sex but i couldn't live without all these other aspects because i think those other aspects uh, of intimacy are intrinsically connected yeah. to sex in some way like the way people will be like oh penetrative penetrative sex is sex but oral sex is not sex no 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 that's sex the way people will be like this is and this isn't sex so rigidly it's all flowing it, 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 it's either i was gonna say it's a flow and it's also like stuff might not be sex but like let's say those intimate things of like kissing and eye contact those are all lead up sex things like yeah. they're still in the umbrella of sex they're the lead up foreplay is still sex it's just before mm. sex Court table. yeah yeah <laughs> I was kind of like thinking about what kind of other perspectives could I bring to the plate on like why there's because there has been a new kind of resurgence wave of voluntary celibacy throughout my googling I went to reddit I went to some articles I found a lot of people are like there was no like celibacy reddit specific page but there was like a lot of questions on like ask reddit or dating advice and things like that about like yeah. celibacy and a lot of it was like people being asexual a lot of it was people being celibate because of religious reasons and just i i understand that like this is how they feel but people being like oh it makes the marriage more special it doesn't i'm sorry it doesn't i can't i'm sorry but me, like research no. shows it doesn't <laughs> yeah and if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. That's your own personal experience on a micro level. But a macro level is it doesn't actually make a fucking difference. Again, it goes back to this whole idea of like people who will abstain from sex being somehow like spiritually higher. I know that monks didn't have sex and I know that you have to abstain from sex and religion, but mm -hmm. like it doesn't make you a better person no. and it doesn't make you spiritually any better. It doesn't make you any better intelligently. It doesn't. Those levels don't fucking matter. But yeah, there's a lot of people being like, I'm asexual, so like I have no desire. I have no need to. And, and that, that makes doesn't, sense. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. It doesn't mean that asexual people won't be in relationships, but it definitely means that their relationships will be very different to like normal, quote, normal relationships, right? Then there was definitely people, <laughs> I found it really interesting to go through the guys who were like, yeah, I'm going to go without sex because I've had some shitty relationships and I just, but they, but they were like, oh, but I'm still going to wank. And it's like, okay, and this goes back into it like masturbation doesn't make it fully celibate i understand that men yeah. kind of like need to ejaculate from time to time so that i feel like if a man's being voluntary celibate they kind of need to service themselves and i understand mm. that but literally one dude was like plus like what can't you get from like s some category of porn and i was like what it's just it's what? just it's interesting to delve into the mind you have a fucked relationship with sex my man like yeah. you have a fucked relationship with sex Especially because it brings up, and like we won't go into this crazy, but like the whole, what do you call it? It's like those, it's like incel, but they like, 
voluntary don't have sex there's a name for it it's not just it's something else and it's like that is such a toxic mindset it's like they can't have sex so they well what is it they don't they reject it they reject it so that they can yeah. ha- like have the control and the power and it's so weird like it's, it's very just, weird it's toxic yeah there was also a lot of articles i was finding about the mm. connection between like voluntary celibacy and the fact that millennials are having less sex which we have discussed previously on the podcast and kind of like you know is that people being like is there a connection and i found some academic articles on it it was interesting yeah. none of it was necessarily relevant to bring up here because i was reading through and i was like meh eh, eh. but then there was also conversations about like the quote born again christians kind of like retake like retaking and reclaiming their virginity back which i find very interesting because it goes back to this idea that like virginity is a social construct that confirms it right like yeah. even the even the christians believe that that's a social construct again it wasn't i guess in the same context relevant of like just for your own sake no religious influence whatsoever just being like i don't want to have sex but i also will abstain from all of these other kinds of sexual intimacy so i was on a vice article that was called the millennials embracing a life without sex now this was written by a man who was 29 going about sex there's there's the gist of it but he brought some very interesting points and i'm going to read from this article now however much you're getting laid you surely can't have failed to notice that we're living through a seismic shift in how love sex and relationships function dating which should be fun remember increasingly isn't the ever-present apps we prod out on buses and in public bathrooms coerce us into a grim back and forth constantly urging us to create ever more appealing versions of ourselves to offer up in the romantic marketplace dating has become like work and our tinder grinder and hinge profiles have become our resumes the snapshots of us we publish online as we seek to digitally negotiate our way into a closed deal that only vaguely resembles real human intimacy. There are productivity quotas to hit, meetings to be arranged, never-ending paperwork, and reports back to be filed in the gossip-hungry group chat. When dating, which after all is how most people arrive at sex, ceases to be fun and in fact becomes a source of extreme anxiety, the desire itself is suffused with a similar sense of paralyzing tension. As desire becomes a source of anxiety, so gradually does the mere idea of desire or being desired. In no time at all, sex itself stops being an attractive option. Anxiety is, I think, the main reason why I find myself at 29 happily abandoning the fight to desire and be desired. Because lust and love no longer feel like a solace and escapism to me. Instead, they seem to be yielding, just like everything else, the surge of transactional neuroses that constitutes life in the digital age. So that was obviously very proseful and poetic i see your face ash what's going on there there's a lot to unpack (laughs) but the one thing that i guess i'm drawn to is the idea of escapism because like i have been in bouts in my life where i've used obviously the whole hoe phase of escapism at the start and 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 then it turned into a feminist thing but it definitely was like a like a thing like that Mm. but like i don't know i just find it interesting especially from like a man's perspective i'm guessing if he says grinder He's not exactly a straight guy, maybe. I don't think he's talking. This isn't him talking about his experience. He's just talking about the space. Yeah, he's just talking about the space overall. Like this isn't him. Like quote, he's just like writing this article about dating and and anxiety. And I think this is totally true, though. He has good points. I get that. It's just I know it's just interesting. It's just interesting to hear from a man and it be so poetic. And you go, oh, you got a point. Yeah, got a point. Yeah. And I think that that's fair because I think this again kind of tying back into toxic masculinity there's kind of this idea that men should always be wanting sex and always Mm. be looking for sex or at least that's like the perception of it right so when you have a man who is like i i'm not assuming because i didn't read the full article but like probably like i want to have meaningful sexual relationships or i want to have a meaningful relationship and it really does like like apps totally feel like that they totally feel like that and that's part Mm. of the problem and that's making people be like well i don't want to go out there and have sex because it's like just like too crazy for one reason or another it is i do wonder like what it will be like for like gen like generations after us because it feels like a sex fest now is it going to be decreasing is it going to be like like we don't know well it feels like a sex fest but it actually isn't yeah that's what the data is showing that's not like but why are we seeing it like i it's weird because we know it's going down but it still feels like a sex fest and i guess it's that whole idea of what people are putting out there it's like yeah having sex so much i'm such a player there's so many options yeah it's not especially because i know people whenever i tell them like let's say like my my body count they think it's going to be a much higher and then i tell them they go oh really that's it i'm like 
Yeah, like because like, if you're recurrently having sex with someone, like that's kind of the whole point. You don't have to add a tally. So. <laughs> another article which was from Dazed Digital Magazine called Why Quitting Sex Could Be the Answer to Emotional Wellness. So they said in this article, practicing abstinence by the very definition of stopping sex may automatically be a way of curbing any perceived negative effects that sexual activity could cause, such as feelings of rejection, emptiness, anxiety, depression, or physiological issues such as sex or porn addiction. Kate McKenzie, a sex therapist at the College of Sexual Relationships Therapists, approach, approaches abstinence from this perspective quitting sex cold turkey might be the best way for some to tip sexual and emotional well-being back into a healthy balance individuals working through a sex addiction can find it may be very powerful to reclaim yourself and your boundaries and redefine your sexuality from a different place she says abstinence can also come from a place of self-preservation and protection particularly in a time where reported sexual assaults are on the rise take jenny not her real name for example jenny is a woman in her early 20s who having experienced sexual assault has been abstinent for nine months stating that it is partly my subconscious protecting myself from potential future trauma so we have again this reinforcement of the Mm -hmm. idea that like sex is this anxiety ridden space for young people and dating is anxiety inducing and that you know stems to a lot of problems like sex addiction or porn addiction which i think yeah with with those things you kind of do just need to go cold turkey let's be real and then we also have this perspective of like abstinence or celibacy to protect yourself sexually as well Mm, and it's interesting because obviously you hear some people go down this route of okay i'm I'm gonna be absent after like a rape or assault but i know lots of people who went the complete opposite and went hypersexual and they have told me because i don't know after mine i was still in the relationship so it didn't and i don't really remember that relationship because trauma but um like i remember my friends who went the hypersexual route yeah they often said they wanted to bury that in other sex which it, it makes sense in that traumatic space but then other others say i just wanted to keep it moving and i don't know it's it, it's interesting it does say a lot about a person and i guess where their head's at if they go hyper or thing because it's the same process it's just two different ways of dealing i know it's always interesting to me absolutely and this goes back to the idea that sex can be used as a form of self-harm and i think this is something that we talk about enough not just in this space but like in general like the discourse around it is very much lacking people use porn as a form of escapism and that's a form of self-harm like you know if it gets to the point where like you can't have real sex because you've been so impacted by porn that's a problem and that's Mm. something that not people can come and people can't come to the realization on their own and people can't come to the realization through other people because people aren't having these conversations about their sex lives and their, their quote private lives because we're so prudish and we're so put off from talking about these sexual topics so openly like we can't do it together and that's part of the problem is like not having these open spaces to talk about especially for men let's just say especially for men i've also seen a lot of people who have similar to yourself ash like with bipolar or bpd like friends in my space or people i know of who have had issues with sex addiction or using hypersexualization as a way to escape the trauma or feel validated or whatever it is and they have come to the realization that they need just need to quit cold turkey and be like no i can't do this anymore because i'm putting myself through too much i'm letting people use me and it's actually it's it's going the opposite end it's harmful yeah quitting is the only way there's someone who i know who i don't think they've been diagnosed but it's highly likely they have something similar to me i don't talk to this person anymore for a multitude of reasons that i can't get into but they use sex as something to harm others and to harm themselves as well it's a process and i think you know why people listening why i don't talk to this person anymore they use it to the point where you know there's no condoms usually and it's just and they fu- and like they fuck around and it's just like i'm not sure if it's they know but it's definitely a subconscious hurting other people and they do it to hurt themselves as well and it's just it's a sad thing that i don't is i think it's pretty fucking common cuz you hear those people who knowingly spread like 
you know, STIs and all that. Mm. And I think a lot of that comes from hypersexuality. Sex shouldn't be deviant, but then there's those people who obviously have something clinically wrong with them who use sex as a deviant tool. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just... They are, like, evil about yeah, it. Yeah, and it's deadly. Like, think like th- think about back in the 90s, and I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure it still happens, but to lesser degrees when people were filling up, you know, during the AIDS crisis with you know filling up needles and yeah. doing and like and, and knowingly giving people aids like ju- through needles and sex like it's just it's sad it's sad because you know right now we talk about sex you either have a standpoint of prudish and sex positive but i think there's that middle ground where these people get away with very bad things yeah. because they they prey on people just being sex positive and they prey on people going oh i don't don't want to be prudish but they do those deviant things and this is what the person i'm talking about does i'm i don't want to identify them too much but then you know they're someone who swings both ways and i think they bank on that to do very deviant acts and it's disgusting final discussion of today's episode is it came up during the talk of my housemates again and it's oh yeah and i believe beth who i talked about before sent in this question to 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 the podcast regarding this whole whole situation so the question is how much of a connection do you need with someone to feel comfortable to have sex with them now indy brought this up before (laughs) yes but i I think it's a a a natural next question to the question we were just talking about and I was the only one in the room again who said, I don't need to be that romantically inclined to them. (laughs) And some of you guys who listen also said that you can separate, I guess, one being just fun and one being like an intimate connecting experience, which I relate to because I'm able to do that. Now, before I was booed up, (laughs) I was able to separate my sex from just the casual kind to the romantic kind. My current partner, who he... He's going to hate me how many times he's getting brought into this conversation today. But, um, you know, we met through the whole phase and this may be a bit sweet, but I knew he was different because all my other guys I was having sex with, it was definitely just casual sex. Like there was an understanding, like it, this is all it's going to be just at like sex. <laughs> but like him, he was in that pool of guys and he, me and him could slip into that romantic kind very easily. And so I always kind of knew there might be a possibility for us to actually go outside the bedroom and like date, which we, you know, we're currently <laughs> which in a you poly- were always talking to me about being like, I want it so bad. I want it so bad. And I was like, baby, if you just keep your eggs in the basket, it will happen. And look I, at you. And I did. You got chickens now. Chickens. <laughs> chickens, bitch. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like I've always been able to separate you know, what, like, I guess decompartmentalize the casual sex for romantic sex. I don't have, to, I don't like, it's not like I'm going to have sex off someone just off the street. You know what I mean? Like you just <laughs> kind of have to. Sometimes people do though. I know, but like, if that's your thing, get it, just be safe. But <laughs> like, I I don't know, as long as like, you don't annoy me that much and you're hot and like, the, and, and the energy is good. Like I, it was like, that's all I need really. You know what I mean? Because that means in terms of who I feel comfortable having sex with, in my hoe phase, it was some guys had the wine and dine me to check their e- e- energy and see if we could act, if I didn't hate them during the process. And Which I think some is the them, safest option as well. Yeah, but then there was also guys who spat game, you know, over <laughs> me- messages, and I was just like, okay, like I like I can judge. And I was like, from memory, I'm pretty sure I was pretty right with all of them. Like I was like, okay, like you're just a casual guy, that's fine. And like as long as like that the energy is good, you're hot you're not like that much of a fucking misogynist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm just kind of like, you're literally going to be in my bed for what? Up 45 minutes. Like, that's all I really care for. You know what I mean? But then like the casual sex and romantics I have, they're so different. So I, I don't know. I think I'm able to separate them. And I don't think when I was having this conversation with my housemates, I was trying to say that. And they're, they're like, no, like I have to have a romantic, I have to have a romantic connection. And I'm like, I don't have to and I don't feel like I should feel bad for that you know what I mean yeah 100 percent. I'm the same I mean <laughs> let's just put it out there it's no surprise I think like again this goes ties back into my change in relationship with my libido or like the kinds of sex mm. I was having from my hoe phase to now because like when I moved to Melbourne I was out of my hoe phase but I was still like oh I want to have sex with people but I don't want to have sex with like just anyone you know what I mean yeah like, 
I don't need to have a romantic connection to you, I would say, but I have to have like some level of connection in a sense of like, are you a good person? Are you going to be like, are you actually a dick? Like what's the level of like you as a person? I see. I think, I think my issue was the fact that I was very much attracted to Cunty people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the word we like to use? That's with an A. I can't think of it. Um, yeah, Highly confident. What's the word? Arrogant. Arrogant. Yeah. That's the word. I was, I loved arrogant men. Like my current partner's not arrogant, but I think as soon as I see arrogant, I'm like confident, good in bed. Okay, go. Anyway, go off. I mean, I would definitely give you that, that like arrogant men probably are more good in bed. Speaking from experience. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking from experience, like they would be good in bed, but I wasn't necessarily looking for like good sex on that level because in my mm. experience, having sex with arrogant men, like even if it's good, it's not gonna. It's not good because it's like, it's not as about me and it's not as about like yeah. the kind of sex I want to be having. So I, I was more careful about who I was picking to have sex with, especially after I moved. But like every time I was having conversations with people, I made it clear that like I don't want to just like have one night stands. Like if you're gonna, if we're gonna start having sex, it's gonna be reoccurring. I just I needed to make sure that people were understanding that it's like I'm not here for a pump and dump. I'm not here for one night stands. I'm not here to just have one and done. Mm. Like we're gonna have a, a friendship. Because I wanted, I wanted to have that kind of a level. Lo and behold, I yeah. also ended up in a relationship. But I made that clear to several people that I had sex with. And some people understood the assignment. Some people didn't. And I'll mm. just, I'll leave it at that. And I think that I don't need to have emotional connection. But I, mm, I don't need to have a romantic connection. But some level of emotional connection in terms of like, yeah. are you a good person? Could I be friends with you? That's it. Could I be, a, could I be friends with you? Could I talk to you? Can I have a conversation with you? Because I don't want to just like have sex and then like you go. Like I want us like talk. Yeah. It's more fulfilling that way. Yeah. And I think that's like when I talk about like the black book or the pool, all my guys who I've ever fucked usually besides like a couple were all reoccurring. Like I probably had sex with them like four times. Oh, I'm to, very like, familiar with your Rolodex after- of boys. <laughs> very. Your Rolodex very of dick. <laughs> Oh my god, we still if we ever go on tour, we still need to caption that. My god, credit We're, to full Aaron. Yeah, like <laughs> we are keeping that. No one take that from us. No one take that. We're talking to the lawyers because we can afford lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> like I do like the idea. Like i I don't think I've ever had a one night stand and not see them the next day. I'm trying to think. I don't like it's always been at least like one or two times afterwards. Like, have I had bad sex? Yeah. Were they dumped early from the roller decks? Yep. I don't know. Most of the guys who prolonged, I was seeing them up to like 10 times afterwards you know what I mean just for you know the little look up <laughs> this has been hot girls theory thank you guys so much for listening to this episode please remember to rate review and subscribe especially if you're on apple podcasts or Podchaser. we'd love to hear from you so remember to email us at hot at gmail.com you can find ash at ashley xo rose on instagram and myself indie at feel by indie on instagram and twitter find the pod on instagram and twitter at hot girls theory we'll talk to you next week guys bye, bye.